Welcome back everyone to our webinar series, Embracing Change. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. We have a incredible guest who's part of the genetic care team working on mindful leadership. And uh, he's just launched a new book called Core Creativity and um, would love to know why and where this came out of. So welcome Ronald. Well, Dr. Ronald Alexander, to be more precise. I know I call you Ronald, but so welcome, Ronald. Thank you for taking the time to be here with us and uh, maybe just give a little background. I mean, I know, you know, we did the last webinar and, and yeah. you know, you talked about the last book, which I happened to realize I read during the webinar, which is quite hilarious. But um, yeah, so so maybe give a little background, a couple of minutes. Everybody has a feel of, of how you got here and then let's deep dive. Okay, well, I have uh, two PhDs. One is in psychology and one is in human behavior. And um, I have been uh, practicing mind-body psychotherapy since 1976. And I was one of the original founders of the Center for Health and Healing at the Cedar sinai uh, Medical Office Towers in uh, Los Angeles. And I was also one of the early... Um, grandfathers in the executive and leadership coaching movement. It was myself, um, Tony Robbins, Jack Canfield, and um, we were all influenced in many ways by the late Jim Rowan, who really was the original grandfather, and we were kind of first-generation um, coaches. Long before uh, coaching and the term coaching was even um, popularized in the last 10 to 15 years. You know, we go back to 1978, um, where we jumped in on the ground floor. And I began my private psychotherapy and creativity and leadership uh, coaching practice by first working with individuals in talent, individual talent that was referred to me by the various talent agencies um, in Hollywood, like ICM, um, CAA, um, and from there, from working with individual talent, I began to uh, provide coaching, creativity consulting and coaching to um, managers and agents in the various agencies. And then from there, I kind of leapfrogged into working with uh, Disney, Universal, Sony, uh, Telemundo, um, in various other uh music and film and television uh, companies. And then in the last uh, 18 years, I began to spread my creativity consulting and leadership coaching into the dot-com uh, industry, especially in Silicon Valley, uh, consulting to companies and working with individuals within companies like Apple, Sun Microsystems, and then here in Southern California, with a company called Snap, which is the overseer for Snapchat. Um, so I've been a featured speaker over there on uh, creativity and mindfulness. And um, my new book, which is called Core Creativity, The Mindful Way to Unlock Your Creative Self, is really a compilation of uh, three different things. One is it's 46 years of working uh, hands-on in the trenches with top talent in all those uh, areas that I discussed, film, music, television, um, and also being in private practice and doing psychotherapy as well as uh, creativity consulting to, to individuals and companies. And then um, the second aspect of the book, Core Creativity, has to do with uh, the last 10 to 15 years of academic research on uh, what makes people creative. I've studied some of the great uh, creators uh, of all time in history, uh, painters, musicians, sculptures, uh, filmmakers, et cetera. And did, in this book, I interviewed 10, 10 different uh, very esteemed and renowned uh, filmmakers and uh, musicians and actors. And the third aspect of the book is very hands-on, and it has to do with 
how you how do you become creative? What, what do you do, and what can you do at home, um, outside of my office, to become more creative? And how to mine and access your what I call the creative unconscious, which opens up the gateway to becoming what I call a core create creative. Wow, beautiful. All right, so so maybe want to talk about the second and the third piece. What do, you, what, what do you feel like going into in terms of let's understand what those geniuses did and what were the core yeah. teachings that we can have and then about you know what, what you've taught or you want to also touch a little bit on the history? What, what do you feel like? Well, let's start with number two, okay. which is one of the things that uh, I extracted from both the study of creatives as well as my interviews with renowned creatives is that they have something in common which are called daily rituals. And it's really fascinating from a research perspective to discover that 75% of all core creatives have the following daily rituals that they, in a very um, steady and defined way, implement as part of what I call the winning formula <laughs> What is your winning formula to be a core creative? And so I'll just go through a few of them with you right now. But fascinatingly, almost every 75% uh, of most core creatives across all disciplines arise in the morning at 6 a.m. Yeah. So they're up before the sun rises. <laughs> and usually almost all of them in addition to waking up at 6 a.m., once they brush their teeth and um, they all have the common daily ritual and they either make a strong cup of coffee or cappuccino, those that live in Europe okay. or in Asia, they have chai tea. And so that's part of how they start their day. And wow. then most were all at their desk at either seven sharp or at eight o'clock. And so for example, in studying um, creative, core creative writers, um, Ernest Hemingway, who was known as a renowned drunkard and <laughs> would write in a very highly disciplined way, regardless of how wild and kind of a bacchanalian evening that he would have, where he'd be drunk as a skunk at 12 or one or two, <laughs> he would get up in six o'clock, have his coffee, and he'd be at his desk at seven or 7.30 every day writing. So core, creative, core creatives, 75% of them employ those two rituals. And then the 25%, instead of getting up and being what we call the uh, early morning uh, awaken uh, errors are what we call uh, locks. So locks is symbolic of birds that go to sleep early around yeah. five or six at night and they awaken early. So you have 75% of core creatives who are locks. And then you have 25% that are owls. And they're the people that they're sleeping 12, one, two, and then they get up and they have, again, most of them have coffee or uh, tea, chai tea or black tea. And they oftentimes don't start working until three or four or five in the afternoon. And many work into the wee hours of 12, one, two. And for example, when I was um, interviewing some musicians, uh, one musician told me that in the 60s, 70s and 80s, the Rolling Stones would, the call when they were making a record would be at 10 o'clock at night. And they would rent a, a recording studio all night long and they'd call it a day at eight o'clock in the morning. But was that but because of cost effectiveness or was it, is it when they were doing well or this was when they were starting because up? They were, they were owls. Uh, okay, so nothing to do with the fact that they were starting up, okay. No. No, they were they were owls. They they're um, as a as a group. Yeah. They all happen to create 
and perform uh, best at night. At night. Okay. So, um, so you, you have two categories of owls and locks no. um, amongst co creatives, creatives. Then a third daily ritual, which is really fascinating, is almost 80 to 85 percent all reported that they perform what's called the daily walk. And so let's just take a, a creative in the dot com industry, Steve Jobs. He was famous for whenever he had to make either a creative decision or a leadership decision. For example, when he hired um, Scully, who was working at uh, Pepsi Cola, he was the uh, CEO over there. Yeah. He took a walk with Scully for several hours. And that was the interview. Like they, they took a long walk and he trusted in the process of that when you're moving, because one of the other things that I wrote about in the book is that when you're moving, you're breathing more. Okay. And when you're breathing more, you have more access to both your feelings and your creativity. Yeah. You, you were going to say something. No, no, I'm just, yeah, I, I agree 100% with that space. So they were walking always together or some were just going for walks in general? Um, most would go for walks alone. Okay. Some would invite their significant uh, partner, but that the, the concept of either walking before they sat down to create, okay. or uh, there was a very large percent that would work, let's say from seven or eight in the morning, all the way to one o'clock, they'd take a nap or uh, have di uh, lunch, uh, take a nap, and then they'd take a long walk. Okay. And then they'd go back to their desk at four oh. or five, either do editing or a musical uh, composition uh, rearrangement. Okay. Many of the musicians that I interviewed um, said that after the daily walk, they would go back in and they would do rearrangements okay. of what they either written or actually put together with the band or with themselves if they were an individual performer. Okay. Another daily ritual that I found really fascinating and it is that almost all of them, both historically and in current time, employed either meditation, some form of prayer, whether it be Christian contemplative or Sufi or uh, Islamic, you know, the, the praying of five times a day to certain directions where there's some physiological movement where they bow down on, on a, a carpet um, and they carry a compass. And that there's something that gets stimulated in the neurotransmitters in the brain that some form of meditation or prayer or yogic or tai chi experience or jikong yeah. open up the neurons in the brain that stimulate creative production. Wow. So that when you enter into a meditational or contemplative state of mind, it changes your body yeah. and then your body's physiology because yeah, the base the brain is not just in the head but the brain goes all the way down the thin brain stem and all the way to the base of your spine and your spinal column that's all part of the brain and um most creatives employ taking time once or twice a day to sit in contemplation. And so, for example, and this is um, someone that it was not a traditional uh, artistic creative, but the, the founder, Ray Kroc of McDonald's, yeah. he took an afternoon walk and then he would sit in his chair and he didn't refer to it as meditation, but he called it thinking time. But he was clearly meditating. But he was he writing? Had, was he writing or he was doing nothing? He was just... Nothing. Just okay. He would sit in, sit in his office, okay. sit in his chair. Okay. And for and how long? Any, any time or just... Minimally 15 minutes up to an hour. Okay. And in one of the, um, of the sitting sessions, in, in Zen Buddhism, we would say he was <laughs> practicing Zazen <laughs> without knowing it is he actually saw the image of the art 
okay. the action. Yeah. Which became the symbol of, you know, uh, the, yeah. yeah, the McDonald's. Okay. And then when I studied Walt Disney, Walt also spent many times a day sitting quietly. Again, he didn't call it prayer. He didn't call it meditation, but he certainly called it thinking time. But he wasn't really thinking. He was actually mm -hmm. emptying his mind, as we yeah. say in Buddhist yeah. meditation. He was emptying the mind out. And then he was trusting that his unconscious and it would give him Snow White, the Seven Dwarfs, Mickey Mouse, mm -hmm. uh, Disneyland, um, Epcot. Because yeah. I consulted to the uh, division at in the 80s at uh, WED, which is Walt Elias Disney Department of Creative Imagineering. Okay. And so they brought me in between 81 and maybe 84. When Epcot finished in Florida, that was Walt Disney's last vision oh. of what was next. That was the end of the line because he died. Okay. And so all of the producers, the directors, the filmmakers, the, the writers, the animators, they all went into kind of a state of grief or loss yeah. because father, his last vision. So what are we going to do next? Yeah. And so I was brought in to, to work with them um, on helping them to work through grief and loss, but also to stimulate future creative vision. Yeah. Okay. Amazing. Okay. Incredible. So these were, these were the habits you signed any, so some were doing it after the walk, which is great because you're emptying as you walk and then you allow the, all the, all the yummy stuff to surface, right? That's, yes. that's amazing. And there's something about the cycle I call it the psychophysiological relationship between movement. If you think of a triangle, movement, um, breathing, and then feeling, and then in the center of the triangle is creative imagining. Yeah. So that as you move the body and you, you download stress, you download or offload um, anxiety, it gives you a time to pay attention to what feelings or emotions that you're having that in the hectic aspect of, your, of one's day, whether you're working individually as a creative or you're part of a team, yeah. there's so much stress. And you being an entrepreneur and a head of a company, you know um, you, you're managing a lot of people as well as managing yourself. Yeah. And that creates stress. Uh, but stress is not a bad thing. That's another thing that... Um, my research showed is that stress is something that creatives thrive on. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. You can harness it and you yeah. can utilize it and you can ride it like a wild stallion, yes. but with this contemplative in quiet time into uh, the walking and moving, yeah. you can direct the energy of stress of the horse of self into the creative direction that you want it to go. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a story if you don't mind. So years yeah, ago, sure. the Wall Street Journal called me and they said, Faisal, um, the top echelon in the corporate space are upset. So there's a big announcement. A vice chairman ended up with cancer. And they said uh, they're blaming corporates for the stress. And as a result, we get sick. And I said, I completely disagree. I'm more than happy to come on a video on TV, live TV. But just know that I will push back if you try to steer me to what they're saying. So I got on TV and I said, all innovation and creativity happens in what is classified as stress out of your comfort zone. The issue is not about being in stress. The issue is our inability to de-stress, which is what you're referring to, that time to do the movement, to do that contemplative quietness and stillness. And I said, if we apply that the actually engagement with stress takes it to another level, which you're referring to. So just wanted to share that. That's you're right on the mark on that. And you know, that's that's a very brilliant um insight that um if you harness stress, another aspect of uh, the research shows that you can transform and transmute stress into creative. Uh, output yeah. in that you don't creatives 
don't want to stay in their their own lane. They don't want to stay in um, what's formulaic. Yes. Businessmen oftentimes are very successful because most business is formulaic. And so whether they are thriving or they go through periods of loss and change in business or downturns, they oftentimes uh, revert back to the formula or what I call the winning formula uh, that they had. And I usually help uh, business men and women who uh, are going through a breakdown period or uh, experiencing a downturn or a loss in their business, but to view it as a, a breakthrough possibility. Yeah, exactly. What's the opportunity and, here? Yeah. And creatives don't want to stay in their zone. They want to ride the wave just like a good surfer wants to catch a big wave <laughs> of stress to take them outside of their zone of comfort. Creatives feel that staying in your zone, or as we say, staying in your lane, that that's a death knell. Um, creatives, like for example, if you take uh, Jackson Pollock, the modern artist in um, Mark Rothko, who which you, uh, modern artist out of uh, New York City, um, when they finished a painting, they oftentimes, their wives would say, they would spend days or weeks in Jackson Pollock, for example, would sit in front of a gigantic, like the size of a studio, of an empty uh, frame. And he would just sit there and smoke and drink coffee, just staring at this white canvas for days, weeks, or months. And then all of a sudden his wife would said, you, she'd see him in there painting with the buckets of paint. And same thing with my Rothko. Just let it out, they just let it out. Yeah, because in the silence, and that's what a, the book called Creativity is teaching people to do, you learn to sit in the silence and you learn to listen with the third ear. And that's the ear of the core creative. And you listen both auditorially, but that's a metaphor for that you're listening to how things are unfolding from your unconscious, from your creative unconscious. And you envisioning, you're actually, you as you get quiet and you offload all of the mind chatter, it allows the upload yes. from the inside out of what it is that you want to invent or create. So and did you, what, yeah. So, so what, what, what would be interesting is to understand, so those who didn't succeed or didn't become at that level of the people you're referring to, did they run out of gas because they didn't have this contemplated quiet period and, and, and the movement? What, what happened to them? Most of the time when you hear the phrase like uh, a musician was a one hit wonder. Yeah. Or their, their first uh, CD or in the, the days of um, vinyl, um, their freshman vinyl uh, record was a, a gold or platinum seller. And then their sophomore and junior fizzled out. Yeah. It's usually because they were trying to follow the formula of the first record. Whereas if you look at people like Crosby, Stills, and Nash, or Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, or Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan is the perfect example. Okay. If you look at his 50-plus albums, and you, you see the progression of him continuously throughout all the records, and even like his appearance, yeah. being a folk singer and being part of the uh, protest movement, Although Bob Dylan always would say, I was never a protest singer. <laughs> I, just, I just wrote songs and the protest movement, took them and made them part of the protest movement. What's a protest singer? <laughs> he was just being creative. Yeah. But you cannot see in any of, of the records that he made, every single one of them is completely different. So there was no pattern. There was no system. There was no... Okay, so he no. reinvented himself each time. He was willing 
to yeah. control alt delete and reboot and rebirth. So he's continuously rebirthing. Yeah. In 64, 65, he, he writes um, like a Rolling Stone, which he does, he goes all electric and he's got Al Cooper playing organ, Mike Bludenfield, who was a prolific blues electric guitar player. And he goes from being a folk singer <laughs> to creating subterranean homestick blues. Yeah. Like a Rolling Stone. He has this prolific explosion and takes the whole music and record industry. For example, the recording of his folk song, Mr. Tambourine Man, yeah. or the birds who were originally all folk singers, they heard the Beatles. And so they took, hey, Mr. Tambourine Man, and they went electric with it. And that was all Dylan influenced. And Dylan actually even flew out from New York to be part of uh, listening to, to them uh, recording and playing uh, their new sound. And they, they were the forerunners to all of the folk rock groups you know, the birds gave birth to the Buffalo Springfield, Crosby, Stills, Nash, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, uh, Poco, the Eagles, and I could go on, you know, all evening. But you see the gem that they possessed was that they had the capacity to mine into themselves rather than to sit and say, what would the market like? Yeah. Almost all core creatives don't create for the market. Yeah. They do not think what's going to sell. Yeah, exactly. They actually link up to what is coming out of them from the inside out. And of course, that's what made Elvis unique. It's what made the Beatles unique, the Rolling Stones unique, Bruce Springsteen, and I you know, could go on uh, endlessly. Yeah, because even when you're running a business, right, and, and you go through, like you're saying, that, you know, about to go through another breakthrough, and the question always is, what got you here will not get you there. But that's the core, is how do I go back into my core, get rid of the, the noise, which is what you're talking about, the mental noise, go back into my, my core, which is, you know, my, my gut and my heart, and let it, you know, emerge and surface once again, and it may be completely a different item or product or whatever it is, right, away. But I allow that and I trust in that, knowing that I have it within me, but I just need to allow it to surface and emerge, right? And yes. uh, that's what you're it, referring to, sounds like. Yes, and those are very, very astute words, Pezo. Uh, when you mine into your core, you connect with your gut and your heart. And if you trust your gut and you trust your heart and you create from your gut and your heart, it's totally different yeah. than creating from your head. Yeah. And I'll give you an example. I was um, having lunch with um, a former CEO of an extremely big, uh, you know, one of the largest media companies um, in the West. And he told me the story about how um, he was involved um, in a merger that had to do with a, a dot-com company. And he traditionally would take a walk um, in nature. And traditionally, he used to, after he would take his walk, he would call two, three, four, five people in his field or in the company a trusted friends yeah. and bounce um, the idea off them. And when he was taking the walk, his gut was telling him, no, no, no. His heart was saying, no, no, no. But his head was screaming at him. Yes, yes, yes. That he didn't want, he, he was in fear in his head. Yeah. And he didn't want to miss the dot com opportunity that he thought was like the future of everything. Yeah. But it happened to be once the he merged his company with this dot com company, it was one of the greatest uh, disastrous oh, wow. uh, mergers in history. So, he, so he, oh, go ahead. 
And, and so what do we extract from that? Well, it, you know, as you said, trust. He didn't trust his heart and his gut. He listened to his head. And in my book, Core Creativity, I, I talk a lot and write a lot about how it's really important in core cre creatives because they sit quietly or they take the walk. They spend time listening to their heart and their gut, which are the centers of intuition. The head in the mind has nothing to do with intuition. <laughs> and um, did I tell the story about me and my dream in the stock market? No, no, go ahead. Okay. Well, and that's one of the fourth uh, avenues of daily rituals yeah. is in my research and in the researching of um, creatives in history is core creatives, they write their dreams down and they work with their dreams every day and they listen to their dreams. And so historically, for example, Robert Louis Stevenson, the famous uh, writer, he used to dream at night entire chapters the inventor of the benzene ring in science, which is two snakes biting each other's tails. He dreamt that <laughs> at, at <laughs> night. And um, so core creatives, we listen and we pay attention and, and we become guided by our dreams in our dream state. We, we pay homage, we bow at the altar that the dream is something that we write, we produce, we direct, in, and we act in. And it comes from our own unconscious. And so, for example, in 2008, um, I was down in Australia in early September, and I was on a teaching training tour of um, Sydney and uh, Northern uh, Rivers, uh, Brisbane, et cetera. And I had a dream. New York Times, stock market crashes. Los Angeles Times, worst disaster since 1929. So I wake up, I write it down, I have a really bad feeling. So I call my stockbroker and I say to him, I want to sell everything. You know, and we're talking like millions of dollars. Yeah. He goes, why do you want to sell everything? The you know, market's doing great. I said, um, well, I had this dream. So he, <laughs> and he goes, oh, God, dreams and psychics and gypsies and astrologers. If, 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 if I moved people in and out of the market based upon what they dreamt, um, we'd never get anywhere. Three weeks later, the market crashes in 2008. And so I learned a valuable lesson. Don't listen to your stockbroker. Trust your heart. <laughs> so you didn't exit. You didn't exit. I didn't exit. Oh, my God. It wow. Me, it took me five years. And I, I'm sharing this because I want people to, to know yeah. that really important that we all at times, no matter how sophisticated we are, and I'm a very sophisticated intuitive, you know, practicing psychotherapy and meditation for 46 years. <clears throat> I have a frequency that I can go right into, but I didn't listen, you see? Yeah. And now, you know, my, my broker says to me, he calls up occasionally and he says, hey, have you had any dreams lately? <laughs> And I say, no, I haven't had any dreams. Well, I, I, are you writing them down? I mean, you're going to call me, right? Next time you have a dream. <laughs> so he's still your broker. He, he, he didn't get thrown out the window. Uh -huh. No, he didn't because he said to me something that was really important. He said, okay, we've made a mistake. But trust me, within five years, if you have the stomach yeah. and everyone else that I was working with, so low and lost. Oh, really? Oh. oh, wow. They exited, you mean? They exited during the bloodbath? I had musicians oh that they thought their, their pension funds were going to go from, let's say, you know, $3 million 
because they dropped to a million. They thought it was going to go all the way down to like 200,000. Oh, so, so they, they went into fear that's going to get worse. Okay, okay, okay. But he said, look, I guarantee you within five years, if you can suck it up, yeah. It. <laughs> yeah. It, it's all going to come back. And it did. It all came back. Okay. You know, to yeah. this day, everything's fine. Okay. But I, I, I have an agreement with him that next time I have a dream and I call you, if you refuse to pull the, the trigger, I'm going to pull it myself. <laughs> okay, that's that's a deal. <laughs> that's amazing. So so interestingly, even the younger, even the ones that are more more closer to today, nobody's playing sports like golf or tennis or swimming. They're all just going for walks. That was the common denominator. Well, that was the common denominator. They all, in addition to the daily walk, they do tennis, golf. Ah, skiing. so the walk is in addition to the sports. Yes. It's almost like sports are sports, but ah. there's something about daily walk. Okay. And the young people, most of them have all read the autobiography uh, I, Isaacson wrote on Steve Jobs. Yeah. And what does Steve talk about? He talks about that he made many of his both creative and um, leadership uh, and management decisions on, on his own daily walk. Okay, amazing, amazing. And 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 the contemplative piece. Do you feel if it's not like you said the whether it's uh, qigong or or tai chi or the prayer of that space, is that what is helping for them to surrender to the yes. perfection of life? and the, the unknowing and the instability and they're okay in that instability, is that, is that also helping? Like how, how are they getting to that place to be able to risk of saying, I know, but I don't know, right? And, and, and trusting, yeah. like there's gotta be that, you know, it's, it's not easy, right? To, to be- Well, you've said four seminal components of the creative process. And that's, first of all, um, letting go of being guided by ego. Yeah. And ego is oftentimes connected to rigidity and rigidity is connected to the need to be into perfectionism. Okay. And perfectionism is going to kill you all the time. Second okay. is you said not knowing. So two tenets of core creativity that I go into depth in the book is not knowing not needing to know, yeah. taking time to not do and not needing to do. Yeah. And those two uh, theorems fit into the third thing that you astutely said. Again, trust. Yeah. You put those three theorems together and you have a working equation to the fourth thing that you just mentioned, <clears throat> which is something core, creati core creatives all embrace, surrender. When you're in your ego, you're in thinking mind, yeah. and you're usually overly identified with who you think you are yeah. and what you think is the right way. Yeah. In Chinese um, philosophy of Confucianism, there's an old Chinese adage, and it says, great leaders and great creatives don't do things right they choose to do the right thing. They don't wow. do things right. Okay. They make Amazing. choices to do the right, right. thing. Yeah. And when you surrender, you're not doing the right thing out of your mind. You're listening to heart, as you mentioned earlier, and gut. Yeah. And you made that very nice connection between heart and gut is intuition. In creatives, whether you're in leadership or you're in the, the arts, heart, gut, breath, body movement takes you into the unconscious. Surrender. So you surrender. You, you lose your mind yeah. and you come into the sensations of your body. So we lose our mind and we come into the sensations and the sensations are connected to the stream of creative flow. In the stream of creative flow is when you, again, when you surrender, when you're watching Michael Jordan or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, 
or LeBron James play basketball or Magic Johnson or Larry Bird, you see that they're in the zone. Yeah. The zone is connected to being in the flow state. Yeah. And they all will say that when they had their greatest games, that they were not in their thinking mind. Yeah. They were not even thinking or looking at the scoreboard. Exactly. They were in the flow state and they were just shh, shh, shh. So we need to lose our mind and come into our sensations. No, because we keep explaining, right? And I keep writing about surrender is not a giving in or a giving up, but it's actually a becoming, right? It's, an, it's, it's a form of evolution, but it's coming this way, not this way. It's, right? an it's, open, it's an opening. Surrender is an opening into yeah. rather than giving up. But, you know, a lot of Western leaders hear the word surrender and they think, you know, like, the end of a war, you know, they surrendered. <laughs> in the mystical, in the um, Buddhist traditions and other spiritual uh, systems of thought and uh, meditation, and surrender means an emptying. You know, there's the famous story that I think I'll, I'll complete with yeah. tonight. Yeah. And that's, there's a young student and he's in Japan and there's a Zen monastery on Mount Fuji. And he comes to the gate and he knocks on the door. And every day he's told for uh, two weeks to come back the next day. So he finally uh, gets to meet the uh, Roshi, the Zen master, the sensei. Yeah. Yeah. And he's sitting before the sensei and the sensei says to him, why are you here? And uh, he goes on, he's talking and he's talking. This is the student. He's talking yeah. and he's talking. So the Zen master puts up, two teacups out and starts to pour tea into his teacup. And the student notices that the Zen master is pouring and pouring and the tea is spilling all over the table and all over his lap. And the student screams out, stop, stop, stop. Why are you doing this? And the Zen master says, because when you're so full of oneself, there's no space. And when you're so full of thinking, everything just pours out. So we have to, and he takes the teacup and he turns it upside down. And he says, when you can learn to empty your mind, you are in beginner's mind. And in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities, but in the expert's mind, there are very few. And I think just just to come back to that, I was just reading, and I'm you know these these Rumi cards, and in there it talks about holding the water in a cup versus the ocean. Most of yeah. us are living in the cup, the water in a cup, versus having the experience of the vast ocean of possibility. And that's what yeah. you're you're speaking about because we're coming from that limited mindset versus the expansive, you know, you know infinity way of, of, of whatever is possible. All right, Ron. Yeah. So let's maybe, maybe before we close a few reminders. So just to nudge people to consider a few pieces. I know you've said them a couple of times, but maybe just to, to remind them of a, a few ideas that they may want to consider to you know, not be in that space, but really move into the, the gut and, and heart space, which is the intuitive. Anything you yes. want to? Sure. Number one is um, have either your iPhone or your mobile phone to record your dreams in or note cards or a, 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 what I call the mindfulness journal in my first book, Wise Mind, Open Mind. Write your dreams down every morning and then spend some time working with your dreams and in core creativity, I, I describe a gestalt therapy process of how to work with your dreams. Two, become disciplined. Creatives are not, most people oftentimes think that cre creatives are very watery and loose and kind of create only when they want to and go with the flow. No, creatives are at their desk at six, seven, eight in the morning. Um, so, have some structure. Almost all the creatives I interviewed, structure. Three, take the time each day 
to sit quietly, whether you just want to call it quiet time or you want to meditate in a more structured way. It doesn't matter what type of meditation. The, the method I work with is mindfulness meditation. But I've studied the cross-cultural systems of at least 10 uh, other forms of meditation in the last 48 uh, years of my life. Prayer, contemplative, Christian contemplative to, to prayer, and then on and on and on, whatever spiritual discipline that you feel most aligned with. Spend a minimum of 20 minutes, once if not more, tw twice a day, morning before you start, and or before dinner or before bed. And then let that 20 minutes build up organically where you get to about 40 minutes. Uh, three, employ the daily walk. Morning or midday, I'd like to take the daily walk uh, midday and then come back, have a very, very, very light, light, almost like a liquid or a soup lunch. And then I meditate because I, I don't want to have my afternoon where I'm trying to digest. Um, and then uh, lastly, is employ and embrace the mantras and the axioms of not knowing and not needing to know, not doing and not needing to do, and live by those. And lastly, employ the notion of surrender into the flow state and trust in the surrendering to the flow state, which means you have to take time each day to reflect on getting into the flow state. All right, beautiful, Ferrano. That was incredible. Thank you. Thank you. I haven't read the book yet, so naughty me. I know that I should be the first one reading it since we are taking care of families in many, many countries together. So thank you very much for that beautiful, you know, concise and also the storytelling that came with it. I think, I mean, I've learned a lot. The only piece that I'm not doing of all of those actually is the chai and the coffee. So <laughs> I make my chai every morning at 6 a.m. Okay. I, I have a cappuccino midday, like either 2.30 or 3. All right. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ronald. For, for your time and, and, and the genius within you. Really, truly, truly grateful. We appreciate it from the bottom of our heart. And thank you everyone for being with us and taking the time to engage and uh, hopefully put in some of the practice that Ronald has shared. Maybe some of you are already doing them, but uh, I nudge you to consider because it will really be game changers. So again, thank you. Thank you, Ronald. And thank you everyone.